So now, you've analyzed, you've reviewed, you've looked at some of the concept of testing. How do you move forward now with the process? You start to design. And in terms of building a fair and defensible test, this is the development process. And I think this is very, very important. You start out with the profession. On the left, these are interpreters. On the right, you have consumers. And those people give you information through a process called a job task analysis, a JTA. Now, you notice under consumers, we have this little thing called a pre-JTA. We're actually in the process of developing a study, a survey, that is going to go out to interpreters and consumers, hearing and deaf, as well as employers, educators, and other people in the field. And we're actually asking questions about specialization in the industry, areas of practice that are specialized. Because the first thing we have to understand is who are we certifying? We know the generalists. We have a good idea about generalists. But we're not so sure about the specialty areas. And a lot of questions came up in the task force about specialized practice and what kinds of needs and demands there were for people that had skills that went beyond just the norm, skills that were applicable that required unique vocabularies or other, um, other skill sets. So we're going to be doing that study first. That information will then feed into the job analysis study. And that will ask a number of questions. First of all, it'll ask the question, well, what do you do? What are the tasks that you do in performing your job? And then it asks, what do you need to know? What skills and abilities do you need to have to do that? Now you start to follow the logic of this thing. In order for, for me to do a task, I need certain knowledge and skill. Well, the test is really about knowledge and skill. But which knowledge and skill? Well, the ones that are required to do the job. And that's what the job analysis does. That then leads to this thing called the test specification which is a very specific document that says in this test there's going to be 20% of the assessment on these particular skills, 50% on these because these are more important, 10% on these. It's a specification so that every time somebody produces a test, it looks the same. It's just like specifying a building, that if you build a building from a same set of drawings, you'll have the identical building. Well, tests do the same thing. We need to have identical tests because of fairness. Remember, we talked about fairness a few minutes ago. So we have a test specification, and that has two branches. That leads to the design and development of both multiple choice and performance tests. So performance tests are linked specifically to demonstrating knowledge and skill required to do the job. And it links to scoring criteria. So we don't arbitrarily score these things. We score them based on what was the expectation in the job analysis about the knowledge and skill, and what level, OK? Um, there's a concept called minimum competency. And sometimes that bugs people. Because when I say minimum competency, I think, oh, they're not competent. Minimum competency is the lowest level that you are competent. And I tell people that brain surgeons are also licensed on minimum competency. But it's way up here, OK? I mean, the, the minimally competent brain surgeon is pretty smart and pretty capable as is the minimally competent interpreter. So that leads to something called a cut score process. And cut score is really only a way of saying, what is the expectation of minimum competency, and how is it reflected in the test? The simple thing in multiple choice is, how many questions do I need to get right? In order to answer the question, you have to ask, well, how difficult are the items? Are they clear? Are they understandable? All of this goes into their there are many, many processes that are, that are designed to, to clearly get uh, to a cut score that's fair and reliable. And that's the end of this circle. So now we have a development process. So you sort of see the, the way that we're going to snake our way through this thing. But we also have design objectives. The overall objective, repairing the confidence in the exam and the certification. If you don't have confidence, it's pretty much worthless. Okay, if people can't trust the warranty, if you go and buy a toaster and you can't decide if I plug it in, am I going to get shocked or not, then you're not going to do it. You're, not, you're going to say, I don't care. The UL means nothing. Well, we don't want the NIC to mean nothing. We want that to be a reliable credential that people can count on. 
Then there's certification objectives. Very interesting point. Right now you have three levels. The task force said we have to have levels, but they weren't quite sure how many. So they said at least two, maybe more, but at least two. And there needs to be specialty certification of some sort. Now we're not sure which. We have down here legal, medical, K through 12, higher education, et cetera. That pre-JTA that I talked about is a study that's going to ask the industry. It's going to ask consumers. It's going to ask employers, what specialties are important to you? What do you really need? Do you need someone who's a medically, uh, who has medical specialization in interpreting? Maybe, probably, but do you need it? We need to find out. We can't just create stuff. We have to find out from the community what's really needed. Then we have testing objectives. Resolve concerns about appropriateness and fairness of testing and scoring. We have other objectives. Make it the scoring time and cost less. Increase the opportunity to take the test. People are waiting to sit the exam now. Can we get them in faster? How can we do that? How can we make it more efficient? How can we make the test uh, shorter, better? And how can we increase test security and reduce the impact of coaching if there is some? I suspect there is. You know who you are. It's not fair. If you take a test and pass because you had a good coach, someone that taught you test taking, we didn't create a reliable test to begin with. A good test is not coachable. You, are, you either have the skill or you don't have the skill, and coaching isn't going to help you. Now, studying will help, learning will help, but coaching doesn't. Okay. So here are some goals of RID's program of the future. It responds to the realities of the world. It addresses the marketplace. It's the gold standard. RID has very high standards. It wants to be the gold standard. It provides clarity. It informs and empowers the deaf community and the hearing community. And it provides information that you need, that, that the consumers need to make decisions and select the right interpreter. And it supports licensure and the growth of multinational and multilingual programs. So they should also strive to be administered in secure centers, readily available, given year-round, instant scoring for computer-based tests. Performance tests should be scored within one week. <laughs> Remember over the rainbow? <laughs> No, that's not over the rainbow. We're, believe me, we're going to show you how that's going to work. Failing candidates should re receive performance and feedback, and tests should be as inexpensive as possible. Those are a lot of really good goals. Do you agree with those goals, by the way? I sort of got that feeling. Good. All right, so now, this is where you really have to pay attention. We're going to talk about conceptual design of the certification program, OK? The NIC future program has two sides. The left side is the generalist side, and the right side is the specialist side. OK, everyone got that so far? I'm going to use my little pointer guy. No, I'm not. Well, there it is. There it is. You see that little guy up there on the left and the right? OK, so on the generalist side, there are two levels. Remember the, the requirement before there be at least two levels. NIC1, NIC2. We're not using descriptive terms yet, because remember, we have to define what the real expectation is. If I say master, I bet you everyone here has a different idea of what a master is. Is that perfect? Is a master perfect? Is a master super, super good? Or is a master just a little bit better than the other guy? We need to define what that is. So we're not going to use the term master or advance or anything else. Level one, level two, very simple, OK? We don't really know what level two is yet, but we know it's better than level one, OK? So here's the way it works. In order to qualify to get NIC level one, you have to have some education and experience. These are the standards to sit the exam. Then you take a test, which is most likely a combination of multiple choice and performance tests, as you have now. And then you are awarded the NIC level one credential. Now. It's the only credential you get from that, 
program because that program is designed to test you for a certain level of knowledge and skill and ability, period. Now, if you want to go on, you get more education, more experience. You take another test that is aimed at another level, whatever that level is that is to be defined, and then you get NIC level two. And now we can say to the consumer, we have designed this program that this person can do this, this, and this at this level, and they can have confidence that we have tested them appropriately. Okay, everyone got that so far? We know the left side. We're pretty comfortable with the left side. The right side is a little fuzzy for us, okay? Because we haven't done the studies that we need to do yet. We haven't done the job analysis study. But our concept, this is a conceptual design. Our concept on the right side is that with the NIC level one, you might be able to get certain specialty credentials by having certain specialized experience and taking a certain specialized assessment. And that might be like the K through 12 specialty. All right, we don't know for sure, but it might be. But there might be other specialties that you really have to already have the level two and branch off from that. Okay, now think of medicine, for example. If you look at the medical uh, certification process, people become MDs, then they become specialized in, in one of the board areas of specialization, and they have multiple levels and all that good stuff. So, the, but it, what it requires is additional experience. Now again, we're not sure. Don't make any judgments based on the right side of this. We're gonna do the studies that we need to do, and we're gonna talk to people and have more feedback and information before any decisions are made, but this is conceptually the way it's gonna work. Everyone got that? Okay.